So we are ready. It's 18 hours. Yes, please start. As is the norm these days, good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to ICS Wednesday seminar. Today we have amongst us a very distinguished speaker presenting on a highly, highly relevant topic. Professor Bruce Dixon, Professor Bruce Dixon is the Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at the George Washington University. His research and teaching focuses on political dynamics in China, especially the adaptability of the Chinese Communist Party and the regime it governs. In today's session, he will be discussing his book, The Party and the People, Chinese Politics in the 21st Century, with special focus on private enterprises. The session will be chaired by Professor Manoranjan Mohanty, who is a founding member of the Institute of Chinese Studies, its former chairperson, and currently its emeritus fellow. A few ground rules, uh, a few housekeeping rules. All audience members are requested to stay on mute for the duration of the presentation. You can raise your questions anytime in the chat box. During the Q&A session, you could either use the raise hand option or speak once the, and speak once the chair has uh, permitted, or you could type out your question in the chat box. Without further ado, I request Professor Mohanty to take on the proceedings. Good evening, everybody, and good morning, Professor Bruce Dixon. Uh, great to have this session with you. Uh, especially now, just after the Peitaiha uh, conference, which may be still <laughs> um, not over formally. And uh, uh, in the context of uh, uh, some of the discussions taking place uh, all over the world about Xi Jinping's various plans, about the third term in the next Congress, and about the new slogan of promoting common prosperity, which has been interpreted as reducing inequalities, um, and of course the crackdown on the private, uh, on, the, on the monopolies mainly, uh, and of course promoting many, many new rules uh, to regulate the private sector. So in the midst of all this, we have a very distinguished scholar uh, whose book on Chinese politics, uh, particularly the latest one, Party and the People. Uh, it's a very interesting book because it has a thesis which is uh, trying to explain uh, the nature of the Chinese political system in terms of a framework focusing on combination of repression and response uh, and how uh, the what he calls the Leninist framework of repression through institutions and both traditional and modern control mechanisms uh, goes on. At the same time, even while repression takes place, genuine substantive responses to people's demands and grievances also take place. So it's a very interesting framework and we will uh, hear more about it. Uh, and uh, especially at a time when the China International Trade Fair uh, is beginning tomorrow, Thursday, in Beijing this time. Uh, or is it, yeah, I think it is in Beijing. Uh, um, because uh, what is happening, who is speaking from where, one doesn't know, because tomorrow also Xi Jinping addresses the BRICS summit, which is chaired by India this time. Uh, so it's very, very timely that we have uh, Professor Brooke, uh, Bruce Dixon to address us on this uh, particular topic. Uh, after he speaks uh, for about half an hour, we'll have two um, uh, uh, young scholars. One is relatively young, very young, <laughs> Sruti Jagat, uh, who is back from Beijing uh, uh, recently. Uh, some time ago, actually, and uh, who's, who, who has been working on 
CPC um, membership, recruitment, and so on. And our ICS CPC expert of the new generation, Dr. Bhim Subba, now in Central University, Hyderabad. Uh, uh, therefore, we will have these two discussions after Bruce Dixon makes his presentation. Then I may make some remarks and we'll have the open discussion. So I have great pleasure in requesting Professor Bruce Dixon to speak. Okay, thank you very much for, the, for both of those introductions. Uh, it's uh, great to be with a group of, of uh, very active scholars. Uh, it's an honor to be invited by the Institute for Chinese Studies to speak today. Uh, and I wanna thank all of you who are, who are here on the call. I know it's the end of your work day, so I appreciate you taking time uh, at the end of your day to uh, hear about uh, both uh, my new book and then with a focus on private enterprises, which kind of goes, has been developing after the book uh, was finished. So let me um, start here by sharing my screen so you can see. Okay, so th this here marks the 20th anniversary, the 100th anniversary uh, of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. What began as a small conspiratorial group of around 50 people back in 1921, uh, now today is a ruling party of over uh, 95 million people. It uh, has been the ruling party in China since 1949, so over 70 years now. Um, and at this point, it seems to face no organized opposition. Its hold on power seems secure. So what explains this longevity uh, for being uh, one of the longest lasting authoritarian regimes uh, in history? Uh, and why is there a lack of, of organized opposition to a party uh, that often, as I'll talk about in a bit, uses repression as a key part of uh, staying in power? Um, so first of all, to understand why the party stays in power is recognizing that it's a Leninist party. Uh, and a lot of the answers to a lot of questions begins with uh, this, this basic point. Uh, on the one hand, that involves ideology. Um, communism is a combination of Marxist thinking and Leninist thinking. Uh, Marxism had to do with the uh, as he put it, the, kind of the key point of communism was the elimination of private property, uh, the development of a classless society that would lead to the weathering away of the state. Uh, the party has largely abandoned those kind of Marxist goals, uh, but maintains the Leninist nature of the party. Uh, and that's a key part of what keeps it in power. Uh, in terms of the internal organization of the party, it remains a vanguard party which means it's very selective recruitment into the party. Only about 6% of the population uh, belongs to uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, in the past, the, the focus was recruiting the so-called three revolutionary classes, the workers, the peasants, and the soldiers. Uh, that's largely been abandoned now. The focus really is on the urban educated elites. In a sense, the middle class of the country, that is now the focus of, of the party recruitment. And the people who are joining the party nowadays are not joining it uh, to pursue that Marxist utopia, they're, pursuing, they're joining to pursue their career goals. And they see party membership as advantageous to their careers, where it's working for the government, working for state-owned enterprise, working in the private sector. Party membership is seen as having advantages uh, in a wide variety of areas. Externally is, maybe the more important part of the, the Leninist nature of the party and how it stays in power. On the one hand, it, it has a monopoly on political organization. There are no opposition parties in the country. There are eight so-called democratic parties that are, that are holdovers for the pre-49 period, uh, but they have little influence. Uh, the party controls uh, what they do. Uh, there's an, it uses a, uh, dual means for monitoring society. One, the traditional focus of building party cells where people live, where people work, uh, combined now with more uh, high-tech surveillance technology. Uh, these two things, the, the network of party cells, uh, high technology, 
gives a tremendous monitoring capacity to see what's happening within, within society. It oversees the government in terms of policy implementation. Um, it appoints uh, all key officials in the party, in the government, in the military, state-owned enterprises, any position of real influence is typically held by a party member and in most cases appointed by the party, which gives a lot of control over both the, the central level of the political system as well as local levels. Um, and in, for, for these different reasons, the party is supreme in, in across these different dimensions. Uh, and that's essential for understanding its interactions with society, uh, but also um, understanding uh, why there's not uh, a opposition to the party that at least that we've been able to identify. Uh, as Xi Jinping said at the, his opening speech, the 19th Party Congress back in 2017, government, military, society, and schools, north, south, east, and west, the party leads it all. Uh, so it, it sort of indicates the party's ambition of, of trying to have leadership over all aspects of the country. Now in explaining uh, how the party leads it all, most explanations begin with repression. Um, that the party in China uses repression to stay in power uh, should come as no surprise to anyone who pays any attention to China. We frequently hear about the harsh treatment of Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang, about the crack, ongoing crackdown in Hong Kong, the arrest of dissidents, other harsh tactics that it uses. Uh, the party zealously protects its monopoly on political power in the country uh, against anyone it perceives as a threat, whether real or, or simply uh, imagined. Given these enduring realities of the, the political system, uh, the use of repression is no surprise. Uh, but what should we make of a political system that also um, so often uses repression to keep to remain in power, but at the same time uh, is often accountable to the public um, in, in terms of policy outcomes, in terms of uh, response to protests that pop up around the country, not accountable to the people in terms of elections, but quite accountable in terms of uh, its willingness to uh, listen to public opinion, at least in, in some areas. Um, the, uh, the policy process is, is shrouded in secrecy, which makes on, on sensitive issues, uh, but on other more routine policy matters, uh, it actively solicits the opinions of experts and the public more generally uh, on most pending legislation and regulatory matters before they're put into effect. On major issues like labor and healthcare, uh, there may be tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of comments submitted online uh, in, the, in the process of final adoption. A more arcane issues like tort law or agricultural innovation, there may be only a couple of thousand, uh, but nevertheless, uh, there's this now a commitment to having public opinion be part of the policymaking process. So why would they go to this trouble of making this, this new institution of public comment available? Uh, research has shown that where there have been higher rates of public comments on pending laws and regulations. There have been fewer protests when the laws and regulations actually go into effect. Uh, so by allowing public comment uh, to take place, uh, it allows people to feel they've had a stake in the outcome and therefore more accepting of uh, the final result. Um, its policies of rapid, rapid economic growth have produced extensive environmental damage, uh, but it has cleaned up its air in response to the international attention it received as well as the public outcry against it. Uh, China has now become a leader of renewable energy um, and, and really a global leader in that, that type of technology, both in terms of the technology and uh, its market presence. Um, this photograph here is 
um, two photos taken from the same window in Beijing, one on a relatively clear day, uh, the one on the right uh, during what was referred to as the air apocalypse back in 2013 when the smog and the pollution was so thick, uh, even air traffic was grounded for several days. In 2006, 16 of the 20 cities with the worst pollution in the world were in China. By 2019, only four of them uh, were in China. In part it's because China's gotten cleaner and part it's because other countries have gotten worse. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it is the party has taken an active step to try and deal with the environmental issues in the country. But those problems remain uh, enormous. In 2019, the last year that we have data for, uh, China contributed 27% of the world's greenhouse gases, uh, more than the US and Western Europe uh, combined. The party, uh, especially local party officials, often engage in corrupt land grabs in order to turn farmland and urban residential areas into uh, industrial and commercial projects. Um, but it also abandons projects in the face of uh, protests. So on the photo on the left is a anti-PX protest. PX is a very uh, toxic petrochemical. Um, that is, that is used in the making of plastics and polyester. Uh, and during the, the uh, 2000, in the past 10 years or so, there have been a number of these protests against the, the building of PX plants. Uh, and in every case, they've either been moved to a different location or simply canceled. The photo on the right is a protest that took place in Shanghai against the, the building of a high-speed rail train that would connect downtown Shanghai with, um, at that time, the relatively new airport in Pudong. Um, but that train would run through uh, urban neighborhoods and the fear was that it would create noise, it would disrupt life there, it would lower property values. Uh, and so the protest was, was launched and was successful at uh, ending that, that project. Uh, it punishes the leaders of protests sort of wants to make clear it's not encouraging people to protest, but often, uh, even when they've arrested leaders, they often find ways of, of reaching a financial settlement when there's been harm done about uh, the illegal confiscation of land, uh, about layoffs with, with unpaid uh, severance packages and so on. When there are material ways of resolving conflicts, uh, the parties at the local level is often willing to do so uh, as long as they don't get involved in more political types of issues. Um, so look first at the, at the issue of, of the party and civil society and then from there turn to the issue of, of private firms because there's a common theme to how the party deals with, has dealt with these, these two uh, important sectors. Uh, the party is wary of civil society. Um, it is a concern that it, it is a threat to the party's authority and a challenge to it. Many observers of China from the outside said there is no civil society in China. And if your definition of civil society are pro-democracy groups that challenge authoritarian regimes, then really there is no uh, civil society of that kind in China. Uh, at the same time, there are a huge number of non-governmental organizations that provide disaster relief, poverty alleviation, environmental awareness, and, and other important uh, social welfare type uh, services. Um, local officials often tolerate and even work with these groups uh, to provide these services. Uh, there are roughly 800,000 registered NGOs Estimates are twice that many unregistered but active NGOs um, that exist in sort of a legal gray area because they're not politically active and therefore facing uh, repression from the, from the state, but they're not officially registered either. Uh, and the party has, has changed its approach to civil society over the years. Uh, during the 1990s, uh, the effort was to constrain and limit the growth of civil society. This was after the 1989 protest in Tiananmen Square, after the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union and uh, Eastern Europe, uh, some of which 
particularly in Poland, were sort of bottom-up protests, um, independent trade union in, in Poland uh, being a key factor, the rise of what became known as color revolutions uh, in Eastern Europe, and the party saw civil society as a threat to, to it, and therefore did as much as possible to constrain and limit its growth. In the 2000s, it shifted to being a more cooperative approach to civil society, in part because there's a recognition that these NGOs could provide important social welfare benefits. Um, local officials would give contracts to local NGOs uh, to support their activities. Uh, for example, providing job training and life skills, um, healthcare, cultural activities, uh, things that were important to kind of help stabilize society and help uh, Im improve people's satisfaction with the work of the government, even though the government wasn't directly doing these things. Uh, environmental groups would uh, uh, be given a contract to provide environmental education, uh, to develop recycling and uh, anti-littering programs, to monitor pollution in the cities. These contracts were, were usually short-term contracts so that they could be canceled at any time. Uh, so the NGOs had to be careful about maintaining good relations with local officials and make sure that they weren't straying into more political activities, such as um, it was one thing for labor NGOs to provide job skills and life training, but something else to get involved in collective bargaining. Um, it's one thing for environmental NGOs to uh, develop recycling programs, but very different to start advocating for policy change. Uh, so they had to work within certain parameters, but a growing recognition by at the top and at the local level that at least some elements of civil society would be beneficial to the party. Under Xi Jinping, uh, there's been return to more of a, of a crackdown against civil society, even the ones that have been cooperating with local governments. She seems to want all activity to flow through the formal institutions that are controlled by the party and less tolerant of the sort of informal arrangements that uh, allow local officials and NGOs to, to cooperate. Uh, in addition to shutting down uh, many of the unregistered NGOs and even some of the registered ones, the party has also been active at one of its key Leninist traditions, which is building party cells. Uh, within NGOs. Uh, when, uh, during the first term of when Xi Jinping was general secretary from 2012 to 2017, uh, the number of NGOs with party cells in them increased by about two thirds from 35% to over 60% in just, just a short period of time. Uh, there are now recent demands uh, coming from the central government, uh, from the central party uh, calling for the uh, abolition of the unregistered groups, which puts local officials in a bit of a bind. On the one hand, they need to show their support, their loyalty to this new initiative. At the same time, they recognize they are giving up uh, important benefits that they've been able to provide to local citizens. Uh, so it may be that they will slow walk some of these, some of these actions, close down some, but not others. Um, the difficulty of doing field work in China nowadays makes it hard to know exactly what's happening on the ground, uh, but certainly the trends are, are not good. Um, now related to this is the ongoing crackdown on the private sector in China. Um, the photograph here is of Jack Ma, who is in some ways the symbol of this crackdown, as I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, beginning last summer, uh, 2020, uh, the party began a renewed effort at trying to monitor and control private enterprises. Uh, it began increasing, uh, again, the building of party cells, which began in the 1990s. So it's been a longer effort, uh, but now roughly 75% of private firms have party cells within them. And more importantly, the party signaled it was no longer uh, interested in having private firms simply produce economic growth, create new jobs, new tax revenue, and so on. It now wanted loyalty from the private sector. 
uh, as a condition for the party's ongoing support. Uh, the, the real turn of events um, um, happened uh, beginning last fall uh, when one of the subsidiaries of uh, Alibaba, which in Jack Ma here is the uh, co-founder of Alibaba, China's large e-commerce company, uh, one of his subsidiaries uh, called the Ant Group uh, was about to have an initial public offering uh, on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, on the eve of that IPO, uh, it was canceled um, uh, at roughly this, the same time Jack Ma was giving, or gave a speech to China's financial and banking regulators, uh, harshly criticized them in public uh, for being more like pawn shop operators than modern uh, regulators. Uh, extremely unusual to criticize uh, uh, China's policy leaders in that way. Uh, it's, in hindsight, it's not clear if, if that's what triggered the crackdown against his company or if he knew it was coming and it was his last effort to try and uh, get revenge uh, or at least you know, vent his, his displeasure with it. Um, but there's a, a new investigation launched into the Ant Group and its financial activities. Uh, Alibaba uh, sustained a, uh, a large fine. Uh, there's continue, Jack Ma himself has largely disappeared from public. For someone who is in the news constantly uh, his absence from the news uh, for almost a year is, is quite notable. Uh, more recently, uh, the ride hailing uh, company in China, Didi, uh, was um, also about to have an IPO. The government recommended it not go forward. It went forward anyway. Um, it is now under investigation for its monopoly practices in um, in the ride hailing area, area it is no longer can enroll new members. Uh, its app is no longer available in China's uh, app stores. Um, uh, the state bought a large, bought a small share of ByteDance, which is the parent company of TikTok, the, the video platform. Uh, a small share of it, but also got a seat on the board of directors, which means it could have veto power over what that company does going forward. Uh, Tencent is another large uh, internet company, uh, both um, uh, the owner of the very popular social media WeChat, uh, also an online gaming giant. Uh, it is, uh, has faced uh, large fines and an ongoing investigation. Uh, last year, um, uh, China, Earlier this year, China announced that it would uh, was looking at the crypto mining, uh, the cryptocurrencies, which largely shipped that industry out of, out of the country. The recent attack on uh, after school private tutoring uh, has largely ended that industry. Uh, there are now new limits on uh, School age kids who are doing online gaming only three hours per week and only on the weekend, um, which is going to be a huge impact on companies like Tencent that that thrive on online gaming. Um, and this comes along with this new theme that we've been hearing for the last few weeks about common prosperity. It's not quite clear what the party means by this or how we'll implement it. Uh, but it's, it's largely seen as influenced by the growing gap between rich and poor in the country. Um, how they will alleviate that gap remains to be seen as a, as a gesture of its, of its willingness to work with the party now. Some of these, these tech firms I've mentioned have, have contributed uh, huge donations to this effort at, at Common Prosperity, uh, Alibaba, uh, gave a donation of roughly 10 billion, the equivalent of 10 billion US dollars, 10 cent, uh, a little bit less than that. Um, so an effort by these companies to show that they're in line with the party's priorities. Uh, there's also been a recent crackdown on celebrity worship of uh, fan groups, on 
There's now a new ban on ranking the popularity of different uh, celebrities. The party's nervous about anything that looks like uh, elections or voting or, uh, you know, I've been talking about it being responsive to public opinion on, in a selective way. It doesn't like these types of rankings and, or polls that uh, provide a more black and white vision of this. So why is this crackdown happening? Uh, there's a couple of reasons, no one of which, um, uh, or all of them are in different ways possible and, and explain part of the truth. Uh, one key factor is simply the need to regulate these industries better, um, that there has been uh, largely unregulated uh, activity in these different sectors, in the high-tech sector, the different internet companies often have monopolies in their area. Um, WeChat, as I mentioned, uh, has an even larger stranglehold on social media in China than, than Facebook does in the United States. Alibaba, even bigger than Amazon. Uh, and so, but it's been largely unregulated areas, uh, especially in the digital economy. So part of this effort may be a reasonable effort to simply bring greater uh, regulation and, and better business practices uh, to, this, to this sector. There are also strategic priorities at play here. China has been talking about decoupling its economy from uh, especially the American economy. Uh, they wanna make it harder for Chinese firms to list on the New York Stock Exchange and other uh, international stock exchanges, preferring that Chinese companies list only in Shanghai and Hong Kong um, the party seems to want to have less reliance on foreign technology and foreign investment, uh, foreign capital. And so part of these, these new efforts uh, may be motivated by that priority. Um, from my perspective, what really ties this all together is it's the party's effort to gain control even over the private sector that had previously uh, been championing. Uh, this is probably the party that leads it all um, theme that, that Xi Jinping announced back in 2017. The party in the past had been ambivalent about um, the private sector. Uh, again, Marx said the elimination of private property was the key to communism. Um, there's been a sort of recognition that because the private sector provides the majority of economic growth, of new job creation, of new tax revenue, um, that, that it, there needs to be a way of working together with it. That seemed to be solved with the adoption of the three represents policy back in 2001. The three represents slogan uh, says the party is, doesn't simply represent the revolutionary classes, the proletariat. It represents the advanced productive forces, which is a euphemism for the private sector. Uh, it represents advanced culture and it represents the interests of the vast majority of the people. Uh, but the party still privileges SOEs over private firms. Uh, in response to the global financial crisis of 2008 and 9, when China announced its, its large stimulus package, almost all of it went to SOEs. Uh, and the private firms were uh, had to fend for themselves and many of them closed and, and went out of business because of the the foreign export markets that dried up so suddenly. Uh, Jack Ma of Alibaba, Pony Ma, no relation to each other, uh, who is the president of Tencent, are both red capitalists, meaning that they're both uh, Communist Party members. And Pony Ma is a member of the National People's Congress, China's uh, national legislature. Uh, but this current crackdown against uh, the private sector shows that even that status isn't enough to prevent people from coming under scrutiny. The ongoing crackdown against corruption uh, is targeted at high level officials as well. And this, this effort against the private sector is in line with that. Party leaders in Hangzhou, which is Alibaba's hometown, uh, are now under, under investigation for their corrupt relations with Alibaba and its different subsidiaries. Again, part of this ongoing crackdown against uh, corruption. Uh, in a different dimension, the private sector has its own source of wealth and power. Uh, and as Samuel Huntington told us decades ago, 
independent sources of wealth and power are a key threat to authoritarian regimes. Um, in a different way, these different companies have been providing microloans, have been providing uh, avenues of, of um, payment to between vendors, between individuals um, that are outside the state's control. Uh, they also collect large amounts of private data. Uh, the party's worried about that data being shared with foreign partners. Uh, it's worried that there may be private data on Chinese leaders themselves, which could be leaked uh, in embarrassing ways. Uh, the party doesn't mind when it uh, collects private data on China's citizens, which it does uh, with, with tremendous um, uh, accuracy and timeliness nowadays, <clears throat> but it doesn't want to be the victim of, of that data collection. So why does this, this all matter? Um, what, what are the possible consequences of this uh, current uh, effort against the private sector? Uh, first of all, um, China is often described as a state capitalist system. Um, this indicates that it wants more state, less capitalism in the economy, or more specifically, more party state capitalism so that what's taking place is not just benefiting the, the goal of economic modernization, but also uh, pursuing the goal of the party's ongoing supremacy in, in all spheres. Uh, the CCP is willing to take uh, a short-term decline in economic growth in order to achieve this, this goal of increased party leadership. Um, it's remarkable there seems to be no pushback yet by the private firms, uh, even though they're all in the same similar industries uh, and would seemingly be, could work together. But one of the key elements of the Chinese political system is that these types of horizontal links uh, collective action against the party is seen as a red line and is not tolerated uh, by the party. Um, the same holds true for civil society groups, for religious groups. Uh, these types of horizontal networks are, are just unacceptable. So there's a big risk to the economy in this current uh, endeavor because it's so important for China's economy. Uh, and therefore also important for its popular support. Um, there's less incentive at the moment for innovation, less incentive for foreign investment, uh, all of which may have a, a, a lingering impact on the economy. But the crackdown may uh, prove to be popular with society. Uh, there's unhappiness with kind of the monopoly control that many of these firms have. Uh, unhappiness about their unfair business practices, their unfair labor practices. Uh, there's the famous 996, where people are expected to work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week. Uh, that has now uh, been challenged uh, in the courts and by this, this ongoing crackdown. Uh, the DD, the, the ride hailing company, uh, has been criticized for its. Uh, the safety of its drivers, the safety of its customers, especially uh, women who have been uh, assaulted by drivers. So the bottom line is that the, this is kind of the ongoing effort of the party to lead it all. Um, and it's true not just in the area of the, of the private sector, also true uh, as I showed for civil society, an effort to kind of have the party be uh, in a leading role in, in all these fears in ways that it had not been able to do even, even before. Um, similar changes under Xi Jinping, uh, protests have now been criminalized in the way that they had not been before. Um, things that are happening outside formal state channels are now seen as, as illegal, uh, not just a threat to stability. Uh, back in 2015, uh, overnight, uh, over 300 lawyers and their staff were arrested. Uh, some of them later released, but some of them, a few of them uh, received lengthy jail sentences. Um, so this kind of put a chill on what was referred to as the rights defense movement of lawyers defending the religious rights, the human rights, the labor rights uh, of Chinese citizens. There's more uh, reliance now on preemptive repression. Uh, there's an attempt to create 
a Me Too movement in China to kind of focus on issues of sexual harassment, uh, but it was repressed before it could really get off the ground. Uh, this year has been renewed, uh, a few new cases that have emerged in the news, uh, part of their crackdown on celebrity culture where, for example, one famous uh, male singer has been accused of rape, uh, has been, been uh, arrested in that regard. The fact that he's a dual citizen of both China and Canada uh, adds to the complexity of that case, but indication that now uh, the party is looking at all types of activities that um, it, it can rely to crack down on things that it doesn't, it doesn't approve of. Um, there's also an effort to frame protest as national security threats, not just crimes, but national security threats. Um, in 2013, the party secretly released a document that was later released to the media uh, known as document number nine that included seven so-called malicious Western values, including constitutional democracy and civil society uh, that could not be taught in schools and should not be mentioned in the media. Uh, international NGOs uh, in the past that did not have to register to operate in China, but now they have to register with the Public Security Bureau, which is the repressive arm of the state China's domestic NGOs register with the Ministry of Civil Affairs. Uh, so they're, they're treating international NGOs and um, uh, as, as threatening stability because they're bringing foreign influences into the country. Uh, and given how nationalistic the population is, this, these types of accusations uh, against any domestic NGO and especially the international ones um, end up being a, a source of public criticism, not just the state, but the public as well. Uh, so in conclusion, what, what is this, what, what is the bottom line for all of this? Uh, the party has survived as China's ruling party for over 70 years because of these Leninist features that I've talked about uh, throughout this short presentation here. And it continues to abide by them in many ways it has strengthened them under, under Xi Jinping. There's no question it uses repression as part of its, its uh, tool kit, um, and even more so under Xi Jinping than it had in the recent past. Um, um, it's, its willingness to be responsive as, as prominent as it was in the past seems less so uh, in contemporary China, uh, and the trends going forward look as though a continuation of this reliance on repression at the expense of responsiveness. So it's my hope that people uh, from reading this book come away with a fuller understanding of China's political system, how it got to be where it is uh, and where it may be going. And with that, I look forward to your comments and questions and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dixon. Uh, that, was a, uh, that was an excellent uh, overview leading to a thesis. Uh, under the changes in the party system, party's governance system under Xi Jinping. Uh, and your discussion, uh, especially on the uh, new approach of handling the NGOs and, and then the private sector and then the overall social governance system under Xi Jinping. That was excellent, many insights. Um, we have two, um, I mean, we have a series of uh, uh, discussions and questionnaires, um, I, but we will begin with uh, two friend, two ICS colleagues whom I had requested to comment. Uh, to begin with, uh, Sruti Jagat, uh, she is a researcher attached to the ICS. Sruti. Okay, good evening everyone and thank you Professor Dixon for such a comprehensive and uh, expansive uh, presentation. Um, and uh, Professor Mohanty introduced me as a young scholar. I call myself a young to be scholar uh, and so uh, present my uh, very uh, minor comments on this presentation. So, um, 
the first point being that uh, professor dixon has made one point clear and that is that this contradiction between um, the party and the private sector between the state and market was long time in the making clearly when three represents is adopted the idea of red capitalists who are going to uh, derive benefits from party membership that very idea goes against the idea that the party is going to retain control over the over these members so what has happened in the xi jinping era is that the party has made it very clear that it is going to demand loyalty out of these private um, entrepreneurs now what this leads to is that what this is what impact is it going to have on economic decentralization because as you mentioned as professor dixon mentioned that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of party uh, leaders in hangzhou were arrested and i mean have been prosecuted in their relations with the and uh, uh, enterprise so what impact is it going to have on economic decentralization is the crackdown on capitalists in a way also a, a way to centralize the party itself to limit the power of state party leaders who have been in cahoots with these uh, private entrepreneurs the second uh, point being that uh, taking this party narrative very uh, seriously that uh, the, taking the narrative of uh, party uh, building seriously uh what is happening here is that uh, the private sector and uh, taking it seriously with the idea that the party is going to expand in all sectors especially uh, the society uh, where uh, we can say that once uh, once we have economic reforms the uh, social sector there's going to be social change there is going to be modernization so in that sense can we see the party backlash as not just an action against private sector that is going to uh, influence public opinion but it is also a way to represent a uh, socially conservative population which is outside the party which is not part of the party and in that sense can what is happening in china right now we we can see that uh, ccp is moving in a conservative direction where it is promoting confucian values so what is happening in china is very similar to what would be happening what is happening in rest of the world also where there is a conservative backlash and the party is ready to take on those conservative ideas in order to be not left out so um, that that would be my um, second point and the third point is that in all of this what becomes clear is that we need to take party speak seriously what has been happening till now is that uh, a lot of the documents a lot of the narrative that has come out uh, through various party publications they are being taken as uh, mere ideology not something that is going to have an impact on how the party really operates which is made to be about power so is it time that we start taking party speak seriously again uh, where we uh, you mentioned that in 2020 since 2020 there has been a crackdown on the private entrepreneurs there has been a spread of party branches and it is in the same period that a lot of documents came out a lot of speeches came out where uh, president xi demanded loyalty but it wasn't taken as seriously by a lot of western scholars uh, and even scholars in china who uh, understood it as uh, or regular so is it time that we start taking it seriously again and uh, my final point would be uh, that you mentioned that why is this backlash happening the question becomes why is it now that the backlash is happening uh, what are the what what is the scenario um, that has led xi jinping to uh, take such an action you mentioned that there is it is socially popular what he is doing the action against monopoly but what would be the other factors that we would consider um, have led xi jinping to adopt such policies thank you again for that presentation i hope i haven't overshot my time thank you so sure. thank you shruti uh, important questions and uh, now may i request bhim subba uh, uh thank you uh, professor monty for uh giving me this opportunity and uh, thank you professor uh, bruce dixon uh, once again uh, i have been uh, i think witness to uh, your the previous book uh, release at fairbank center uh, uh, the dictator's dilemma 
and you and I had to, you know, get an auto, uh, autograph copy of that book also then. And uh, and at, and for today's talk, really, I was revisiting that book again, although I, re I read it like three or four years ago. But uh, some of these uh, 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 conclusions or drawings, actually, uh, when we look at some of the conclusions that you have drawn, and especially that uh, the idea of repression within Leninist party systems, I do see in that uh, you know book, and 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 like since do communist party have a choice today? And, and definitely, I wanted to make that at the uh, you know one of the obvious uh, comment, and as well as the question uh, that I want to pose it to you, and uh, and I uh, do look into how. Uh, does, Len uh, does Leninism also uh, look into the, although the party has evolved and transformed itself uh, since uh, the theory of three represented before that, but how does uh, re reforms, you know, have been institutionalized within, or has it been really institutionalized? Because within Leninism per se, uh, we don't see the institutions that can really lead to succession of uh, leadership. How does it uh, manifest that? One of uh, the observations that I wanted to uh, uh, sh uh, share and which you have also alluded in some of uh, your talk here. And uh, the state capitalism. Now, uh, if you look into, and, and the Communist Party of China, as you have already said, it, it had been a very, uh, punctual student of history and especially communist, uh, you know, Soviet Union and the disintegration of Soviet Union, how that has evolved. And no matter today what Xi Jinping goes everywhere within uh, the bar, uh, within China, whether it's to, to minority regions and, or to some of those party enclaves or even Politburo uh, you know, study sessions, he invokes, uh, you know, disintegration of Soviet Union and the causes for that. So has China or has Communist Party per se evolved from that uh, mentality still? Or is it, is it still uh, fearing that kind of a situation there? Although uh, you tend to see a bit departure from the Soviet, uh, sorry, uh, the Soviet, uh, you know, program of that, okay, first you open the economy up, then the political reforms follow later. But is it again going back to that? So uh, the, the third uh, comment that I really want to look into is party leads at all, one of your thesis that you say is, so is Puang Chushin a part of that uh, idea? Uh, not forgetting the original missions of the, society, of, of the party that uh, the party has invoked. That would be one of my uh, observations that uh, has some parallels. And it, for me it personally, it looks like some of the parallels that you are trying to draw on. The fourth observation that I really, uh, uh, you know, wanted to ask you is that my personal observation is with regard to, is the party looking at the, uh, looking at Leninism as an organizing principle, which has always been, uh, because the, the Communist Party of China won't succeed as such, uh, the, the integration, how it has evolved. So how do you see uh, the focus from, from, ideology per se is governance today, so to say, the governance of China that Xi Jinping talks about. The uh, Leninism can be a party principle and organizing principle, but how do you see the governance per se? Because governance per se for China and Communist Party of China or Xi Jinping himself has become the cornerstone of legitimacy today, whether with yeah. regard to uh, uh, contradictions or to uh, you know solving issues of of China today that has it uh, that has faced and its turbulences, I do see governance as a new ideology. So I don't. I, having said that, I just want to rest here. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Wim. Thank you. Well, um, Professor Dixon, you may respond to uh, these comments briefly. Uh, Okay, thanks. These were a great set of, of uh, questions and comments. Um, and I wanted to get a quick uh, 
respond to a couple of them, especially the ones that overlap. So uh, I think this is definitely the uh, Shruti's comment about is, is it part of a re-centralization of uh, the party's authority. And this has been a key theme of the Xi Jinping era, the anti-corruption campaign largely limits what local officials can do. So there's a, a need to be loyal to, to the party and to Xi in particular. Um, and so the, whether that also motivates its crackdown on, on the private sector uh, is not quite as, as obvious, but they do kind of fit together. There's an effort to kind of get the, the uh, from the top to the bottom, everybody on the same page, everybody working with the same uh, set of priorities. Uh, interesting, the comment about uh, whether the party may be, its current policies toward the private sector may be in response to these socially conservative values in the country. Uh, that's a type of responsiveness that I hadn't um, thought of, but, but it's an interesting focus because that has been a trend in, uh, in China, in India, in the United States, in Europe, in Brazil, you name it. Uh, <coughs> people who thought things were moving in increasingly liberal direction in the sense of having less state control are finding now in fact, uh, public opinion isn't necessarily in favor of that trend and governments in these different countries are now responding in kind uh, in ways that may appear to be quite popular uh, even if they're very um, unpopular with the targets uh, of some of these policies. Uh, and I, I, for the comment that both uh, uh, Shruti and, and Bim mentioned, uh, I think it's, we've been dismissing ideology in China since the beginning of the reform era. Um, there's a recognition that Xi Jinping thought is becoming now a new type of ideology. Um, there's this constant publication of not so much his speeches, but quotes from him throughout the years. Uh, there's been the books of his, his, his speeches, party officials are now required to read and discuss all of his speeches. Uh, so maybe we do need to take it more seriously, uh, not so much as a guide to policy perhaps, but as a window in terms of what the, the priorities are. Um, um, Lessons from the, the Soviet collapse. This is my, my colleague, David Shambaugh has been uh, promoting this idea uh, since the time that he wrote his book on the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and it's not clear whether <coughs> party leaders are actually learning a lesson from that, or if people who preferred a more conservative approach now point to the Soviet Union collapse as justification for that approach and for the necessity of it um, as opposed to pe in the past, they were more inclined to have a more liberal perspective and now they've changed their mind. So I think it's, especially for Xi Jinping, he's talked about this constantly about the, the, uh, uh, the dangers that the Soviet Union has uh, for, for China. Uh, as he put it, that there is no one um, willing to stand up against Gorbachev's reforms and therefore Presumably, he is the one who was standing up to the reforms that came before him to undo the damage that may that may result. Um, um, which, all the more, getting back to Shruti's question, all the more reason that maybe we should be paying more attention to Xi Jinping's thought, as hard as it is to read. Uh, maybe we do need to spend more more time reading it uh, as an indication of where things may be going. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know Suresh Goel, Ambassador Suresh Goel is uh, ready to launch the question <laughs> session, but I'll just make uh, a very brief uh, comment um, about two things. You know, your main thesis that uh, uh, under Xi Jinping, there is more repression and less response. In other words, there has been a reduction in responsiveness. Uh, you know, I have a feeling that uh, uh, that doesn't work. More repression has to be accompanied by more response. Otherwise, the costs of repression increase. Uh, and uh, you know, on three points, he has uh, emphasized 
how this regime and his propagandists have emphasized how this regime have uh, you know abolished absolute poverty, have uh, uh, handled COVID so well, and have um, you know proved themselves as a uh, as a global power more um, uh, successfully or effectively than others. It's 19 and hours. Each one of these can be debated, but uh, you know that's the way they, they propagate. So that's my first comment. The second comment is, you know, in 21st century, now we are almost at the end of the first quarter of close to that of the century, two global trends are very, very significant. One is the global civil society, global public opinion, global media, uh, global currents. Yes, global NGOs are restricted further in China, in India, uh, more so uh, during the last two, three years, and so on. Uh, yet, uh, the regimes know that it, it matters, uh, whether it is human rights, Kashmir, religion, um, in, in India, we, you know, we have several cases going on, and so farmers' movement, and so on. Uh, uh, that is one, and uh, therefore, how this? Uh, on the one hand, there is more restriction, and you are very right. Uh, constraints on NGOs under Chiang Chemin, cooperative approach under Bhutan Thao, and uh, restrictions or control under. Um, Xi Jinping, I think that's an excellent formulation uh, on NGOs. But I think there is considerable evidence, uh, the environment, and so many other issues, um, considerable evidence that there is sensitivity to global civil society, global public opinion, global uh, media. Yes, we also see the counter media uh, reports and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, on the one hand, that is, uh, I mean, there is a global civil society, global opinion as a force. Second, all over the world, there are local, in, local groups, local people's demands. Uh, and it's true that after 2010, we haven't seen the uh, public report in the NPC of the mass incidents. Okay, but we know that, uh, and you have very rightly referred to several of them, several categories about land, about environment, about corruption, about governance failure, above all, about day to day uh, uh, life difficulties, uh, whether it is medical problems and, and so on. Uh, and therefore, the local people's assertion is a uh, is a fact all over the world and all countries, elites, authoritarian, democratic, whatever we may call them, they, they, they are uh, finding ways of uh, responding to, uh, responding to uh, this phenomenon. Uh, in your framework, a very powerful, uh, imaginative uh, political analysis framework, how do you uh, look into Number one, the global civil society force and the global upsurge of, uh, I would say, local democratic uh, forces uh, all over the world. Thank you. Uh, would you like to respond now or we will come back after a, a round of questions? Uh, why, don't, why don't I take a, a quick okay. answer to your questions and we'll, we'll go to the audience. Um, it seems that China, that the the CCP's response to global opinion, global civil society, is to try and isolate China from it. On the one hand, uh, there's greater limits on people's abilities to access the internet to get information from abroad. Uh, China, the, the Chinese leaders often frame international influences as hostile to China, as part of this ongoing effort by Western countries to weaken China and to keep it weak, uh, which is a remarkable criticism given how rapidly China has grown and how fast it has risen. To say that Western countries are trying to keep it weak 
uh, just seems silly, but it does resonate with the public uh, that there's, there's propaganda about patriotic education, about the impact of the West on China in the past, uh, clearly resonates uh, with, with, with many people. At the same time, it's trying to shape global public opinion about China. Uh, greater efforts at, at external propaganda. Um, it's, but it's kind of uh, making it difficult to get that message across because as diplomats have turned to this so-called wolf warrior style of, of diplomacy, more um, uh, a harder edge to their message that had been the case in the past. So their, their reputation has been declining at the time they've been trying to improve their reputation uh, in part because the way they're going about doing it. Uh, so there, there has been this growing trend of global civil society, global movements of different kinds. And it seems as though the party's effort is to try and limit its impact in China, at least so far. Um, for issues of local demands, I wouldn't frame it so much as, as local democracy as it is that the party is now trying to channel those demands into formal channels through the petitioning system, through the court system, uh, and not into street protests. Um, so in that sense, again, it's a way of trying to be responsive to, to public opinion in ways that won't threaten political stability the way that street protests do. Uh, whether those demands get ignored once they're in formal channels uh, is, is more difficult to ascertain, uh, but it does seem to be one of the trends that uh, the new approach that the party has taken under Xi Jinping. Sorry, thank you very much uh, uh, for those excellent remarks. And uh, now Ambassador Suresh Goyal. Uh, thank you, Professor Montisa. thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Mr. Dixon. That was a delightful presentation on uh, what is happening in China in terms of the CCP and the control it exercises over the people and the, I would say the corporate world. Uh, you mentioned, it was very interesting, you mentioned that the Chinese government of late has also begun to discourage listing of the companies on New York Stock Exchange. Earlier, they had gone uh, difficult on the tech companies, the capital companies, et cetera, et cetera. And recently, I also heard that they have basically uh, come down very hard on the private education technolo technological com companies also, uh, asking most of them to withdraw from tutoring, et cetera, et cetera. My sense is that, you know, the control of Communist Party over China was never in doubt. I think people, they have, the very fact that the membership is so much in demand, they know who calls the shots in China. So I don't think it's a real the reason to reassert control or supremacy of the party. However, ever since Xi come had come, Initially, as you will recall, he was actually very gung ho about the Chinese companies, Huawei going all out to gain control over the economy, do you know, do all kinds of things. But of late, he has begun to withdraw inside, looking inside rather than encouraging Chinese economy to go outwards. To my mind, that seems a sign of insecurity, a sign of fear a sign of concern that uh, he is losing control. Uh, do you get a sense that Xi Jinping is going through that kind of psychosis or fear and that therefore he has to come back with a more assertive way of functioning? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dixon. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we don't have raised hands or do we? But we have some uh, questions on the chat box. Uh, they can ask questions directly uh, if they want. Uh, is uh, uh, Mr. Eram Asraf from UK, uh, is he able to ask his question? No, it doesn't seem to be. 
and uh, Raj Gupta. Okay, Rabi Futalingam, uh, honorary fellow ICS and uh, one of our senior members of our China community. Rabi Futalingam. Yes, Rabi. You are mute. Ravi, you are mute. Uh, Ravi, you are mute. You are muted. Sorry, sorry. Uh, Professor Dixon, uh, once again, thank you very much for that wonderful uh, presentation. It was really illuminating. Uh, my question uh, to you is on science and innovation. Um, Xi Jinping has on many, many occasions uh, uh, stated the enormous importance of science and innovation. And in fact, innovation as the key driving force for the future growth of China in, in many areas, not just economic, but other areas as well. Um, and he has, he has literally thrown a lot of money at that problem in terms of resources and plans and so on. I won't list all of that. But at the same time, the atmosphere that you describe of increasing control, increasing political supervision, which will include that over science and innovation, cannot but stifle uh, the atmosphere that is required uh, for change and innovation. Indeed, the private sector was possibly one of the big dynamos of innovation. So looking at these two forces now, sheer resources, money, the might of the state being put into, <coughs> into the uh, into innovation, generating innovation. But on the other hand, the aggressive atmosphere. Now, how do you think this is going to play out? Thank you, Ravi. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Nirmal Panda. Uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, first of all, my uh, uh, sincere, sincere most thanks to uh, Professor Dixon for uh, uh, such an insightful uh, view into the Chinese uh, Communist Party and its uh, uh, growing control over the various uh, strata of the Chinese society. Uh, sir, uh, my question would be, the uh, I, I, I find a dichotomy. On one hand, uh, uh, we find, uh, although the Chinese economy is not growing the way it was growing a couple of years back, but we find uh, the Chinese society, you know, making a huge stride. And uh, I believe they intend to, uh, you know, uh, to, to be... Uh, the the uh, numero you know by 19, uh, 2049. But uh, uh, don't you see, sir, there is a huge dichotomy. On one hand, we say that uh, under Xi Jinping, the present leadership, the fifth generation of the Chinese leadership, the, we find uh, there is a huge control and uh, a huge uh, interference, especially with the uh, Chinese uh, corporate world as such. Uh, so how do you see it? Uh, isn't it a, a dichotomy? On one hand, they are making a lot of stride. Their uh, economy is rising, science, technology for that matter. Uh, you know, uh, you talk about space science, space technology, okay. military technology and all, sir. Uh, what is, how do you see this? Sir? Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, yes, uh, Era Masraf. Oh, hello. Good afternoon. This is Iram Ashraf speaking from the UK. Thank you very much for your presentation. I really yes, enjoyed introduce that. Introduce yourself. Okay, so my name is Dr. Iram Ashraf, and I'm an independent researcher who is interested in China's China studies, and I'm working at the moment in Pakistan-China relations also. Um, my interest today in Professor Dixon's theory was in, in why has the CCP managed to survive for so long. Um, and one of the things I wanted to mention was its economic success even, the economic growth. And I was wondering that the recent um, policies which have been implemented by the CCP, 
what does Professor Dixon think of them in terms of, I mean, he's already mentioned that there's a lot of story um, related to the economy of China and part of the policies are affected by it. Because remember, it's the economic growth which has given the CCP the economic potential to control the population, the repression that he spoke of. It's, it's the economic growth which has allowed that. So now they are talking about China having to make that jump into a developed economy from a developing, because technically they're still the largest developing. So they have to make that leap into a developing country. And part of the concern they have is the growing debt and the, the fear of defaulting. And, and therefore that having an impact on some of the policies and the controls they are now imposing on a lot of even these firms. So I was just wondering what Professor Dixon thought about that um, in, in terms of guiding CCP recent policies, trying to regulate the economy. Okay, I know we have a number of questions. We will take one more and then Professor Dixon may respond. Uh, Dr. Indrani uh, Bole. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, thank you, sir. Um, and uh, thanks very much uh, for a uh, 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 I mean, a beautiful presentation for the book from uh, Professor Dixon. I have one question. I have two. I had uh, posted two questions on the chat box. One is uh, pretty similar to other distinguished uh, questioners, uh, 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 rather, uh, Mr. Butalingam, etc. But another question is I mean, the questions is, are these that is CCP afraid of attack on its uh, legitimacy? And therefore, the insecurity has come up uh, in a sense. Is it is it insecure? Does it feel insecure? And secondly, will repression curb the human creativity and the goals uh, they have set up for the 2049, uh, that is the centenary agenda uh, for the, uh, uh, you know, for the independence centenary? Uh, so these are the two questions uh, uh, that I would like uh, him to elaborate, you know. So, Thank you very much. Well, Professor Dixon, please. Uh, there's a couple of themes that kind of run through these various questions and comments. Um, and one has to do with why is the party taking this approach? Does, is, it, is it really threatened the way it seems to be um, acting? Um, and, you know, without knowing exactly what the, the actual thinking is of China's top leaders, uh, it's, it's hard to know if something has changed that has that has led to this. Is it? Uh, it's, it's not Xi's own priorities because the shift towards repression happened around the time of, of the uh, the Beijing Olympics in 2008 and the international financial crisis that came soon afterwards. So so the, the change to repression that we normally identify with Xi Jinping actually began years before he came into office. He's extended them in many ways, increased them. But this more heavy-handed approach uh, preceded his uh, becoming China's top leader. Um, whether it reflects a sense of insecurity, personal preferences by, by leaders or, or factions that are at the top. Um, uh, I remember one of, one of the reviews I had for my first book uh, coming out of grad school was to really understand um, why Chinese leaders make their decisions. I need to explore cognitive psychology. And I thought, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to convince this reviewer that, that uh, and the editor told me to ignore it. So um, <laughs> I don't quite know what's happening in the minds of China's leaders. Uh, they do seem to take a more risk averse approach. All the public opinion surveys indicate high levels of support. Uh, an ongoing support. Part of it is derived from economic growth, as many speakers have mentioned, uh, but it's also based on uh, a sense of patriotism, uh, recognition that the quality of life in terms of access to healthcare, access to education has improved, uh, access to the internet has improved. So things that we don't always associate with, with regime support, but on an everyday basis, uh, uh, improve people's lives. And the shift toward repression has not been whole scale. It hasn't affected everybody the same way. Uh, it's tended to be targeted towards people who challenge the party's priorities, who cross those so-called red lines. Um, 
but it has also become more apparent for those kinds of groups. Uh, it's more immediate, more direct. Um, and in, in that sense, it, it does seem to be a shift of tactics, uh, if not their overall strategy for, for staying in power. Uh, the ambassador asked a great question about uh, the private tutoring. And I think it's not just about this current crackdown on uh, or current approach towards the private sector. Part of it also seems to be uh, this reminded of Shruti's question about um, uh, social uh, uh, conservative views within the country. There's a concern that this type of extra school tutoring is very expensive. It's a lot of pressure on kids. Uh, and for young parents or young couples who are deciding whether to have kids, whether they have more than one kid, uh, the expectation that you have to send your kids to these tutoring programs in order to get into better schools makes the cost of living so much higher for them. So one purpose of this seems to be to make life more affordable in China's cities uh, and therefore reduce the cost of living and encourage uh, young families to have more kids to deal with this demographic crisis that China may be facing of a shrinking population uh, in the not too distant future. Um, the other theme that, that ran through a couple of the uh, speakers uh, questions had to do with uh, the role of innovation and the party's approach and how it may affect uh, the economy. There is this paradox on the one hand of having increased political control and at the same time expecting people to be innovative economically. Uh, the school system teaches people to think, to memorize things uh, rather than to be creative and, and innovative in that way. Uh, so it's hard to kind of separate those priorities on orthodoxy and loyalty and then separately become innovative in other ways. Where China has been successful so far in innovation has been taking existing technology, existing products making changes to make them work better, to, to be able to produce them cheaper, to adapt them to the Chinese market. But in terms of creating a new product, um, they have not yet been able to uh, show that they've been able to do that, at least yet. Uh, as I mentioned in passing, they're now a leader in renewable energies. Uh, almost all the solar panels that we have in the US come from China. Uh, it wants to be a leader in artificial intelligence, uh, which is a likely to be a driving force of economic growth going forward. So it wants to, to stake a claim in these areas where uh, the future of the economy, both in China and around the world will likely be, whether they will be successful in that, they're throwing lots of money at renewable energy and artificial intelligence whether they will actually be able to uh, be innovative in a way that makes them a world leader in this new wave of innovation would be a big challenge for it. Uh, the track record so far it has not been real strong. On the other hand, people who bet against, the, bet against China, bet against the CCP, end up being proved wrong. Uh, so um, the fact that they are committed to it and are prepared to spend those kinds of resources on it suggests to me that, that they, will, they will have a big impact. At the same time, how their approach to the private sector where much of that innovation takes place seems to run contrary to that longer term goal. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it has been an excellent uh, session, uh, very insightful. Uh, I'll just make a brief comment to conclude, uh, unless there are any other questions. We have five minutes or so. No. Okay. Um, you know, about the private sector, we, uh, right from Lenin's new education policy to Mao's four class United Front, where national bourgeoisie is a partner in the new democratic revolution, and the switch on, switch, switch off approach even during Mao's time towards uh, the role of the bourgeoisie. Um, um, and then, of course, you have uh, a full-blown utilization of the private sector under Deng Xiaoping. 
I, th I think the, um, the point to remember is the relationship between a communist regime and the private sector uh, has no one pattern. It, uh, it has many possibilities because socialism is not state capitalism. Socialism has certain norms of, uh, uh, you know, distribution and management and participation of workers, participation of producers and so on. You know, the uh, original Marxist uh, formulations on socialism. Uh, and therefore, the, you know, if you look at the forms of public ownership in any Chinese uh, annual uh, statistical yearbook, uh, I have sometimes counted there are 16 to 22 forms of public ownership, cooperative ownership by the state, ownership by the state at this level, at this level, at this level, and so on. Uh, and in that system, what kind of private enterprise operates uh, is, is very important. Uh, and therefore, we cannot reduce it as just a party controlling the, uh, controlling the business in any mechanical way. Uh, uh, you know, on the one hand, they're regulating the private uh, monopolies. On the other hand, they're saying that China is more open today than ever before. Uh, that, that is a uh, you know, loud claim of uh, uh, contemporary uh, slogans. So uh, therefore, I think we have to rethink about the role of private uh, enterprises uh, in uh, uh, systems which may or may not be socialist, but who proclaim themselves to be socialist. That's one point. The second point is, why this uh, repression and response and uh, the variations of degrees, more repression, less response, or certain kinds of response more like innovation and so on more and, uh, 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 and the party presence in direct management of society, economy, politics, culture, uh, much more than ever before. Now, uh, probably because there is no going uh, away from the settled development path, the Tang Xiaoping path of modernization and achieving the goals of European industrial revolution. With all the colorings of Confucianism, Chinese tradition, socialism, and all aspects of Xi Jinping thought that uh, package it in such a nice way, with many more interpretative additions in his many new speeches and so on. Uh, no deviation from becoming world's number one economy, world's number one military power, world's number one uh, industrial power, uh, innovation power, and so on. In other words, the European industrial revolution with all its stages, uh, industrial, technological, communication, fourth uh, industrial revolution, and so on. There may be fifth and so on. Uh, in other words, that trajectory, they don't want to give up. Therefore, when they talk about the second centenary from now to 35 and 35 to 2049, that goal, they don't want to deviate at all from. Uh, and therefore, repression, response, and many other legitimation uh, and uh, many other legitimation strategies will come under Xi Jinping and after Xi Jinping. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think uh, both our uh, approach to uh, productive forces in societies like China uh, and to political forces of governance and control and legitimation in societies like China, India, US, and so on, I think need uh, even more nuances uh, than political theory and comparative politics have so far provided us. But I thoroughly enjoyed Professor Bruce Nixon's presentation and thank you very much on behalf of the Institute of Chinese Studies. Thanks a lot. Thank you all very much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you.